Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series where we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the hosts of Mordor Precon from Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth and its face commander, the aptly named Sauron Lord of the Rings, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which commander we'll be covering next, who won last week's poll, and which commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Sauron Lord of the Rings is a 9-9 avatar horror with Trample that costs 5 and Grixis and has the following abilities. Firstly, whenever we cast him, we amass 5 orcs, mill 5 cards, and return a creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. And secondly, whenever a commander an opponent controls dies, the ring tempts us. Breaking down his core stats, Sauron possesses a gigantic CMC, an even bigger stat block that's above average for his cost, as well as possessing built-in trample to ensure he can reliably swing in with it for damage, and a pair of abilities that, fittingly, allow him to make a big impact on the board when he comes down and gain power as our opponent's commanders fall before him. Taking a closer look at his first ability, it technically has Sauron come down as a 14-14 across two bodies, which generates us a lot of board presence right out of the gate, and then allows us to reanimate any creature from our bin on top of that. With the mill 5 beforehand still giving us the option to play him even if our bin is completely empty to hopefully get a reanimation target into our grave for him to bring back, easily allowing Sauron to get upwards of 20-20 worth of stats onto the battlefield on top of whatever effects the creature we reanimate has, which is fantastic for both building up an instant board state if we don't have one already, or building on our existing board state to further press our advantage. That said, it should be noted that this effect is a cast trigger, not an ETB trigger, meaning we'll typically be restricted to hard casting our commander to get any of his effects unless we just want a 9-9 trampler, which is still fine but much less impressive. Then moving on to his second ability, it simply generates us value through the one ring as our opponent's commanders die off, which happens often enough in a game of commander to proc reliably, and whose effects, while not super impactful, are still nice to have. Particularly its second tick, which gives us an on-attack loot effect that helps us prune our hands and set up our graveyard for any of our commander's subsequent castings, or for any other reanimation sources we happen to be running. So, as we can see, Sauron Lord of the Rings is an enormous commander that wants us to hard cast him so that we can build up our board via mass and reanimation, then use his massive trampling stat block to crack in with while he generates us value through the ring, which is impressive on paper but in practice lacks an immediately obvious direction to take him in. Even when looking at the base deck, it appears to be going in two separate directions, one more focused on his ability to set up our graveyard and reanimate creatures to build up our board presence, and the other more focused on Amass to take advantage of his Amass 5 when he comes down to build the biggest orc army possible, which when combined work well enough, but, in my opinion, don't have enough synergy with each other to make the best build we can with this version of Sauron. So, in an effort to get as much value out of Sauron as possible, I decided to leave the Orc army building to Saruman the White Hand, who is much better at building it than Sauron is, and focusing all our efforts into maximizing the value we get out of Sauron's graveyard setup and reanimation, which we'll be primarily doing by loading up the build with the biggest and nastiest creatures we can reanimate, ranging from sources of repeatable card advantage that we can still crack in with as they replenish our hands, ways for us to continually keep the board clear of our opponent's creatures while we build up our forces, and reanimation targets whose abilities are so powerful that, if left unchecked, they will completely take over the game for us. 
And of course, to further supplement this game plan, we'll be adding in additional ways outside of our commander to load up our bin with reanimation targets, and even more reanimation spells to build upon the existing ones included in the base build to more frequently cheat those creatures into play, ensuring we'll be able to reliably build up our board with our most powerful minions from beyond the grave, before the Dark Lord descends onto the battlefield to break those who oppose him himself. So let us make our way back to Middle-earth one final time, this time to the black volcanic plain of Mordor where the fortress of Barad-dûr resides, and within it our commander, Sauron, the Dark Lord, the Black Hand, and the Lord of the Rings. For centuries he has resided here, lacking a corporeal body since his defeat in the War of the Last Alliance, all this time gathering his power and stirring long dormant evils to rise and herald his return. And now the time has finally come, with the Dark Power having regained enough of his former strength to restore his physical form once again, and lead his army of long forgotten evils across Middle-earth once more. And once he finds the ring, no force on Middle-earth will be able to oppose him. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and playstyle, let's take a look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. Starting off with our kept creature base, we'll mainly be focusing on hanging on to the best reanimation targets the core build has to offer so we can set the foundation for our reanimation game plan. As such, we'll be hanging on to Cavern Horde Dragon, whose combination of a big hasty and evasive stat block in addition to its on-damage mass treasure generation is superb at getting in for damage reliably and generating us the mana we need to reanimate or even hard cast our high CMC creatures, the Balrog of Moria, who is an even bigger hasty trampler that we can cycle away to generate mana and get him in the bin to be reanimated, that also provides non-destruction removal when it dies to help us deal with our opponent's boards, Rampaging War Mammoth, which again can cycle itself into the bin to set itself up to be reanimated, and serves as a scalable artifact board wipe we can use to pop our opponent's back row at instant speed as we do so, Inferno Titan, whose free on attack bolt on a decent sized body aids our damage output and or helps us pick off up to mid sized creatures with every swing, and Scourge of the Throne, who is yet another large evasive body that not only makes itself bigger as we crack into the player with the most life thanks to the throne, but also gives us an additional combat phase as it does so for our commander and other big reanimation targets to take advantage of to continue piling on the damage. Then as some slightly smaller retained creatures that we can either hard cast or reanimate, we have the legends Lord of the Nazgul and Shelob Dreadweaver, which may not have the raw stat blocks of the previous entries, but still provide the build with solid utility. The former by tacking on a free 3-3 body to every instant and sorcery spell we cast to build up our board state, which is roughly a quarter of our deck, and he can eventually turn into 9-9s nine if he sticks around for long enough, while the latter serves as a silver bullet against Against other reanimation decks by exiling their creatures and then giving us the option to return insignificant creatures to grow her and generate card advantage, or reanimate powerful creatures to use them ourselves. Then to help pad our core stats, Treasure Nabber will be retaining its spot as a means for us to ramp ourselves by temporarily stealing our opponent's rocks when they use them, which is a great way for us to quickly generate the mana we need to hard cast our commander or other reanimation targets in hand, as well as Hostage Taker which we can use as creature removal if needed, but we'll be primarily using as a means to permanently steal our opponent's best rocks so we can use them to speed up our mana base while slowing down theirs. And then to wrap up our kept creature base, we'll be hanging on to Moria Scavenger as a free loot effect on a body that we can use the turn it comes down and helps us build up our board with its amass whenever we send a reanimation target to the bin, Anger holding on to its position as a way for us to grant our commander and all our other reanimated creature's haste once we get it into the bin, which is a fantastic way for us to get use out of their massive stat block sooner and is decently hard for our opponents to interact with since it does so from the graveyard, and Notion Thief staying in as well as a flash speed way for us to deny our opponent's card advantage while stealing it for ourselves which we can even surprise our opponents with from the bin with the final build's various sources of instant speed reanimation. It's then on to our kept instance, in which the only two that made the cut are the two drops, Arcane Denial, which is a solid and cheap source of spell disruption that hampers our opponent's plays while cantripping itself so we can dig deeper into our deck for more resources, and a thrill of possibility 
possibility, which serves as a staple source of flash speed card selection and graveyard setup to simultaneously fill our bin with reanimation targets and to dig deeper into our deck for the reanimation spells needed to cheat them into play. Then reaching our sorcery holdovers, we'll begin by hanging on to the spells reanimate, extract from darkness, and too greedily too deep to further build upon our reanimation game plan, all of which allow us to bring our creatures back into play from the bin at either a dirt cheap price to speed up our tempo, a moderate rate that also sets up our bin further in the process and can hit our opponent's creatures too if they have a particularly juicy target in their bin, or at a massive cost that's often as much as it would cost to hard cast a creature, but makes up for it by also serving as a board wipe as the creature comes into play to help us retake control of the board. And speaking of board wipes and reanimation, Living Death will also be retaining its position as yet another means to wipe the board, as well as a mass reanimation effect for all creatures in all graveyards, which may be symmetrical, but will certainly help us a lot more than our opponents considering the overall quality of our creature base. And then to round out our remaining kept sorceries, Faithless Looting will be staying in as another piece of card selection and graveyard setup, this time whose flashback allows us to play it a second time from our bin. Feed the Swarm keeps its position as a serviceable removal spell that helps us deal with creatures and, more importantly, enchantments, which our colors are not particularly good at dealing with once they're in play. And Blasphemous Act makes the cut as a staple board wipe that helps us cheaply retake control of the board if it starts getting out of hand before we can set up our board. Closing in on the end now, as we reach our kept artifacts, this category will consist entirely of mana rocks, which we'll be needing in order to get to our high CMC commander and to hard cast our high CMC reanimation targets if we need to. Those being ever flowing Chalice, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Mind Stone, Commander Sphere, Basalt Monolith, and Worn Power Stone all of which help us speed up our mana curve at relatively cheap prices to help us get to our high CMC spells that much faster. Then as our last mana rock and retained artifact, we have Relic of Sauron, which provides further ramp and fixing while also serving as a repeatable source of card advantage and graveyard setup on top of that to further fuel our game plan. And finally, reaching our held over land base, we'll be holding on to the Mana Lands Command Tower, Crumbling Necropolis, and Path of Ancestry, all of which tap for all our colors to provide solid fixing, the Czech Lands Dragon Skull Summit, Drowned Catacomb, and Sulphur Falls, the Reveal Lands Choked Estuary, Foreboding Ruins, and Frostboil Snarl, and the Battle Lands Smoldering Marsh and Sunken Hollow, all of which tap for one of two of our colors and typically come into play untapped thanks to our large number of basics to provide even further fixing without sacrificing speed, the Painland Sulphurous Springs and Underground River, which again tap for one of two of our colors to improve our mana base's consistency even further without slowing us down at the cost of only a single life, and lastly, the Slow Fetches, Evolving Wilds, and Terramorphic Expanse, which help fix us in the early game in addition to helping get our check lands and battle lands to come into play untapped as well. And then for our kept utility lands, Rogue's Passage and the Black Gate will both be staying in as means to ensure that our creatures will still be able to get in for damage even on the most clogged board states, and a Desolate Lighthouse will be staying in as well as our final retained loot effect from the base build to provide us with a bit more card selection and graveyard setup from the relative safety of our land slot. And finally, we'll be keeping the six islands, six swamps, and seven mountains from the base build as our basics to round out our mana base. That leaves us with a final tally of 67 cards, including basic lands that we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 33 cards to replace. So, now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. Beginning with our creature upgrades, we'll start off by cutting a good chunk of the creature base that cares about amassing orcs to make room for big, high-value reanimation targets for us to cheat into play. As such, we'll begin by axing the Amass Focus Legends, Saruman the White Hand, and the Mouth of Sauron, so we can give their spots to the Praetors, Shouldred Whispering One, and Jingataxis Core Augur, both of whose effects are incredible for us and backbreaking for our opponents by either forcing our opponents to sack their creatures while we reanimate ours each turn, or by reloading our hands each turn while forcing our opponents to discard theirs, respectively, often resulting in them completely taking over the game if they're able to stick around for even a single rotation. 
Then continuing on this trend of backbreaking abilities, we'll be cutting Grishnak Brash Instigator and the temporary theft effect and a mass he provides to slot in Archfiend of Depravity, who passively reduces our opponent's creature base to only two creatures each turn to ensure they can never build up their board presence past that so long as it's in play, and the Orc and Goblin flavored a mass source and evasion grantor Corsairs of Umbar losing its spot to Itali Primal Storm whose on attack effect can net us up to 4 free spells per turn, increasing our tempo so much with just a single swing that it may be impossible for our opponents to catch back up. From there, we'll be replacing some of the build's not so impressive reanimation targets with some more impressive specimens of our own that will have more impact. With the middling pseudo evasive troll of Casa Doom and the expensive AoE edict Voracious Fell Beast being traded out for Scourge of Care Ridges and Pestilence Demon, both of whom are big evasive beat sticks that we can pump mana into to level most of our opponent's boards with the AoE damage they inflict, which most of our creatures can either avoid entirely or have sufficient toughness to live through. Null Spine Dragon and its somewhat clunky to use draw effect being replaced with Nezahal Primal Tide, who more reliably draws us cards as our opponents cast their spells and can be used as graveyard setup if needed to have it protect itself from removal and wipes, and Monstrosity of the Lake and its underwhelming AoE stun effect being axed in favor of Reaper from the Abyss, who takes advantage of all the removal we'll be doing on both our and our opponents' turns to passively pick apart their boards even further. Grima Saruman's footman will also be losing his spot here, who is admittedly a very solid source of repeatable spell theft, but since we're more interested in casting our own spells over our opponents, we'll be replacing him with Hoarding Broodlord, who can tutor up any of our most powerful reanimation spells as it comes into play to ensure we always have access to them, and has a gigantic evasive body on top of that to inflict much more damage than its predecessor ever could. Then from there, we'll proceed to cutting the various miscellaneous orcs and goblins included in the base build to add in one last wave of reanimation targets. With Goblin Dark Dwellers and its ETB spell recursion being exchanged for Demon of Dark Schemes, who is bigger, evasive, and serves as an ETB mini wipe and a source of repeatable reanimation that benefits from all the board clearing we'll be doing. Merciless Executioner's ETB AoE Edict being cut in favor of Shard of the Void Dragon, who provides repeatable AoE Edict removal every time it swings in, and can potentially grow bigger as our opponents sack artifacts away either to its effect or for value, and the removal-focused goblins Goblin Crater Maker and Siege Gang Commander, who don't have the support needed to be great in this build, are getting benched to make room for the card advantage generating demons, Lord of Change, and Infernal Sovereign which are both solid ways of keeping our hands topped off as they come into play or as we cast our spells and or make our land drops, while again, just like most of our other reanimation targets, being absolutely massive and evasive to ensure they can be a threat outside of just drawing us cards. And lastly, as our final upgrades to our creature base, we'll be cutting Gutter Snipe and its spell-slinging focused burn in favor of Obsessive Stitcher, who provides us with another free and repeatable source of card selection and graveyard setup, as well as an instant speed reanimation effect to drop a reanimation target into play on our opponent's turns to surprise them with its effect, or just give it pseudo haste to swing in with it, and removing the Orc and Goblin support piece Orcish Siege Master so we can give it spot to Archpriest of Shadow. Shadows, whose backup temporarily turns any of our evasive beat sticks into a reanimation spell for the turn when it comes down, and that we can later use in conjunction with our evasion granting sources and board clearing effects to continually reanimate our creatures at no mana cost. Then moving on to our instant upgrades, we'll mostly be concentrating here on our ability to set up our graveyard with reanimation targets while digging deeper into our deck for reanimation spells. With the somewhat unreliable graveyard setup that Forbidden Alchemy and Factor Fiction provide being scrapped in favor of Big Score and Unexpected Windfall, both of whom are preferable since they pitch cards from our hand instead of our deck and ramp us with treasure to help us hard cast our creatures later, the Amass and Spell Recursion focused Treason of Isengard and Summons of Saruman, both of which would be much more useful in a deck featuring Saruman the White Hand as its commander, being shelved for careful study and frantic search, which add more dirt cheap ways for us to dig through our deck and fill up our own bin, costing us only one mana or being technically free since it untaps our lands respectively. The off-theme spell theft effect that Lidless Gaze provides being removed to make space for Dahada's ploy, 
which provides even more instant speed looting and we can cast a second time from our graveyard thanks to Jumpstart, potentially pitching another reanimation target into the bin as we do so, and considers Cantrip and Top Deck Graveyard setup being sidelined for Tainted Indulgence, which we're running as just another copy of Thrill of Possibility in this build to cheaply set up our bin and dig for additional reanimation sources. And then as our last pair of new additions to our instance, we'll be swapping out the middling draw spell Deep Analysis Analysis and the actively bad removal spell Bitter Downfall. To add in, you find the Villain's Lair and Black Sun's Twilight, which are both decent removal thanks to the spell disruption and non-destruction creature removal they provide, and fit better into our game plan by alternatively being another loot effect we can use for even more card selection and graveyard setup, or as an instant speed reanimation source if we're able to pump enough mana into it, both of which are nice to have access to. Then reaching our sorcery upgrade, the main changes we'll be making here will be adding in more ways for us to reanimate our creatures so we can reliably get them out of our bin and into play. With the Spellslinger payoff Fiery Inscription and the Pillow Fort piece Revenge of Ravens being cut in favor of Persist and Stitch Together, which are both fantastic cheap reanimation sources whose limitations are easily worked around so we can cheat the majority of our creature base into play with little effort, the way too expensive boon of the Wishgiver getting axed to make room for Victimize, which lets us trade any one of our utility creatures or our Orc army for two reanimation targets from the bin for only three mana, and the decent but due to changes made to our creature base, now unnecessary board wipe languish being traded out for dread return, which is a pretty by the numbers reanimation effect that we also have the option to use from our graveyard for free if we have three creatures on board we're willing to sack for its flashback cost. We'll then also be cutting the other redundant board wipes included in the base build, Decree of Pain and Subjugate the Hobbits, for the X spells Entreat the Dead and Finale of Eternity, which take advantage of our pretty hefty ramp package to either reanimate multiple creatures from our bin, potentially at a cheaper cost if we get lucky with its miracle, or by dealing with three creatures with non-destruction removal, and, if we're able to get to the 12 mana necessary, reanimating our entire graveyard as we do so. And then as the only non-reanimation spell addition we'll be making to our sorceries, we'll be removing Wake the Dragon, which is admittedly a very good spell for the big evasive body that permanently steals artifacts that it creates, but since we can't cheat on its massive cost through reanimation since it's a sorcery, we'll be replacing it with Cathartic Reunion, giving the build one last cheap and efficient loot effect to enable our game plan even further. And lastly, reaching our artifacts and our final three upgrades to the build, we'll be exchanging out the OK Pseudo Removal and a Treasure Generating Aura Shiny Impetus, the decent but off-theme token creating and eventual theft effect in the darkness bind them, and the quite frankly bad land destroying land field of ruin, for the mana rocks Demir Signet, Racto Signet, and Is It Signet, all of which help us handle the final build's massive mana curve more reliably if and when we need to hard cast our commander or any of our other reanimation targets. So, now that we've covered all 33 cards that we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this pre-con upgrade. This deck currently has 28 creatures including our commander, 9 instants, 15 sorceries, 0 enchantments, 11 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 37 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 19 CMC5 plus reanimation targets in our 99, 9 of which have passive abilities, 6 of which have on attack triggers, 4 of which have ETB triggers, and 5 of which have activated abilities, along with 16 sources of either single-use, mass, or repeatable reanimation, and 19 sources of graveyard setup through loot effects, self-mill, or cycling creatures, giving us a respectable suite of creatures to cheat into play with a wide variety of effects they can use to help us take control of the board in conjunction with their massive stat blocks, along with plenty of ways for us to send them to the grave and reanimate them once they're there to work alongside the reanimation our commander provides when he comes down. 
For general deck stats, we have 17 ramp sources, 8 card draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 8 board wipes. With our ramp being a bit higher than average to help us get to our commander quickly, as well as hard cast our high CMC creatures if we have to, our draw being slightly lower than normal since we have a lot of card selection in the build already to compensate, and we'll be primarily using our graveyard as a resource as well, and our number of board wipes being through the roof since we have a decent number of reanimation targets whose sole purpose is to prevent our opponents from being able to build up their board states. Looking at our mana curve, we have 1 0 drop, 5 1 drops, 13 2 drops, 11 3 drops, 8 4 drops, 5 5 drops, 6 6 drops, 7 7 drops, 4 8 drops, 2 9 drops, and 1 10 drop leaving us with a very heavy looking curve that's actually much faster than it initially appears since we'll be ramping pretty hard and typically won't be hard casting our high CMC creatures anyway, in which we'll be spending our early game looting to set up our graveyard with reanimation targets while digging through our deck for land drops and reanimation sources, then proceed to just cheating out massive threat after massive threat from our graveyard, and, should our opponents manage to survive until that point, capping off by summoning our commander and pushing for Lethal with the huge amount of power he dumps on the battlefield as he comes down. The final price of the build then comes out to be 7527 after upgrades. This price does not include tax or shipping and assumes that the price you paid for the precon was $40. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can trade out Black Sun's Twilight for Ideas Unbound if we'd rather have additional early game card selection and graveyard setup over late game removal and reanimation. Infernal Sovereign can be replaced with All Seeing Arbiter if we feel that the life loss from its predecessor is a bit too much and we want to take advantage of all the discard we'll be doing by depowering our opponent's creatures. And a careful study can be swapped out for Exhum if we want another source of cheap reanimation in the build if we find we already have enough ways to set up our graveyard. And then for further upgrades, Lord of Change can be cut for Runescar Demon, which serves as another way for us to tutor any card we may need from our deck when it ETBs on a big evasive body. Extract from Darkness can be traded for Animate Dead, which is a much more efficient reanimation spell that allows us to get our reanimation targets into play faster. Inferno Titan can be swapped out for Jenga Taxis Progress Tyrant, whose passive free spell disruption for our opponents and free spell copying for us each turn is quite powerful and can get out of hand very quickly if he's able to stick. Archpriest of Shadows can be subbed out for Ancient Brass Dragon, who provides much more reliable reanimation on an evasive body that can potentially reanimate multiple creatures per swing from both our and our opponent's graveyards. Blasphemous Act can be shelved in favor of Rise of the Dark Realms, whose mass reanimation of all creatures from all graveyards is often enough to end the game on the spot. Lord of the Nazgul can be benched for Shuldred, whose front face is a decent enemy-only edict, and whose back face, the True Scriptures, provides even more removal, hand disruption, and eventually another Rise of the Dark Realms to again threaten to end the game immediately. And a Shard of the Void Dragon can be exchanged for It That Betrays, who still forces our opponents to sack permanence as it swings in, but also allows us to take those permanents for ourselves as they sack them away to either its or any of our other edict effects. And lastly, we can cut Pestilence Demon for Ancient Copper Dragon to provide ourselves with all the mana we'll ever need to hardcast our commander, our high CMC creatures and spells, or anything else we may need copious amounts of mana for. Provided, of course, we're willing to spend a copious amount of cold hard cash in order to put it in our deck in the first place. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Starting off with the build we'll be covering next, since we've completed all the precon upgrades for Lord of the Rings, we'll briefly be going back to March of the Machine to cover a build featuring our last poll winner, Quintorius Loremaster. So stay tuned for a spell reanimator build featuring him next week. Then moving on to last week's poll, it looks like out of all the alternate commanders from the precons, Saruman the White Hand was able to claim the top spot, so look forward to a Spell Slinger Amass themed build featuring him coming soon. Then proceeding to this week's poll, we'll be having three five color commanders from all three of the latest sets vying for your votes with this week's options being Omnath Locust of All for March of the Machine, Niv-Mizzet Supreme for March of the Machine Aftermath, 
and a Tom Bombadil from Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth. So please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, before the deadline on June 30th, and let me know in the comments who you voted for, and what commanders from the latest sets you want to see me feature in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.